Um, is it amplifying my voice? Great. Um, thanks, everyone, for if you're here to hear computer science just and you're in the right place. Um, I think this is a little. Yeah, um, by the way, I wasn't joking about Eyes, if you want to cut them in half, uh, please help yourself. You can come and do it while I'm talking so that you don't have to do it while Luke is talking uh, or not. Um, yeah, so, so it's really exciting to have Luke here. Um, for those who aren't aware, uh, he's a professor at the University of Washington, also a, a researcher at Meta, uh, and has done a lot of incredible work over the years. You might know him uh, from Elmo or Roberta or Bart or just a huge amount of work on self-supervised training of uh, language models, uh, and generally speaking, at the intersection of machine learning and natural language processing, did his PhD at MIT and postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, today he's going to be talking to us about some recent work on uh, non-parametric language models. So really happy to have you here. And uh, uh, yeah, let's get started. Thanks, Luke. Uh, thanks, Paul. And thanks, everybody for having me across all three campuses. I'm not sure exactly how it all works, but it's a real pleasure. I um, particularly feel amazing because I was actually, sorry for the UNC folks, but I was an undergrad at NC State, and I haven't been back in a really long time. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to go visit my undergrad research advisors group along with others. It's going to be super fun uh, to see them all get in person there. Uh, the talk today is about non-parametric. I'll define what that is for you as we go. But roughly speaking, at a high level, uh, you know, we all have heard of ChatGPT and GPTX and so forth, and so this is in that space. But it's a way of thinking of trying to do things a little differently than they're currently done, which will hopefully make things kind of more efficient and easier to maintain and easier to use and more understandable in why they act the way they act. So I'm assuming that everybody in the audience knows uh, what ChatGPT is. You probably even recognize the interface just from this little screen grab I did. Uh, sometimes I do a live demo, but this time we just did a slide. I asked ChatGPT, what do you know about the Triangle Computer Science Distinguished Lecture Series, which I think is what this is, I hope. And then what do we think? Raise your hand. Will it do a good job with or know what it is? Raise your hand. Or not know what it is? Would I have ever heard of it? Okay, so I only got one no and I like 10 yeses, so everybody else doesn't know anything about ChatGPT. Okay, so here's what I got. Um, and it shows that also how honored I am to be included with this group of speakers, but uh, this is really great, right? This is what this lecture series is, and I'm looking forward to visiting UNC and do tomorrow. Um, but these things are not perfect, so they're really expensive to train. I don't know, probably tens of millions of dollars went into training this model. And the facts are not always right, so I couldn't tell for sure. I had to go do a little bit of research to check whether the facts were right. Uh, probably the people in this room don't know, but it turns out this lecture theory started in the mid 90s, not in the early 2000s. NC State has a really beautiful list of all the speakers. And that also allowed me to double check these speakers. And notice it says recent speakers. So Susan Eggers did speak, but she retired in the early 2000s from UW. So she was from 2001. So that's not recent. And as far as I could tell, the other two speakers did not ever speak in the sense. Okay, so this is kind of typical of what you see in these models. They have troubles with obscure facts, but they get a surprising amount right, and they're just beautifully fluent. So these language models have changed the world. They're very, very useful, but they're far from perfect, and we have a lot of research to do. What exactly is this language model? Well, as a mathematical object, it's this simple function that, given the start of a document, can predict the next word in the document. And if you play with ChatGPT, like I just showed you, if you actually watched it do that, you would see it kind of spitting out one word at a time. I'm sure we've all seen that demo. Where it's doing that, it's literally taking this function, applying it over and over again, reprocessing the input, and predicting the next word over and over and over again. And inside of this model for predicting the next word given all the previous words, 
is an unbelievably giant neural network. Really, really big thing, you know, potentially hundreds of billions of parameters, just, just gigantic. I'm not going to talk a lot about how to train such a model. There could be a whole separate talk on that, but more about how to use it in ways that are going to get us different kinds of outputs uh, than we saw in the previous, or at least understand why we're getting the outputs. But it turns out this really simple idea is really, really universal. So one of the big breakthroughs in the large language models lately is that everything you might want to do in NLP can be reduced to the problem of predicting the next word. It's not really true, but to a first approximation, you can think about it that way. So these are some screen grabs from the, um, the demo or the open AI demo of the like resolution, but it says classify these things by examples. It gives different things and then it shows the examples of how they should be classified. And then the last one, you only have the input. You don't have the class labels you'd like to assign to it. You say complete that string. By analogy, it will kind of know what it should do and it will predict the, 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 the right classes. Uh, similarly, if you want to uh, summarize a document, you take that long input, you, you put the token TLDR colon, and you ask it to predict the next token a bunch of times, it will spit out a beautiful summary of what came before. And the reason it does that is because it's trained on the unbelievable scale on the internet. So it's trained on like up to a trillion tokens. So somewhere in those trillion tokens, probably like a million times, it's seen TLDR with that relationship between the two pieces of text that surround it. And that's enough for it to learn to do these tasks, just from, just from no explicit supervision, only what automatically exists on the web. You can go on and on like this. You can do question answering. You can do two colon, a colon, even in context. And it's really shockingly good. So a while back, I had a PhD student that did a whole thesis on a custom neural network for, for, for generating cooking recipes. I really love that work. There's a lot of cool architectural stuff going on. But now you just have ChatGPT do it for you, zero shot, no problem. And then my own PhD thesis was roughly in the area of English to SQL. It was Lambda calculus. It was linguistically motivated. But you know, I spent eight years of my life on something that these models can basically do zero shot with no work at all. And I'm still very excited about them. OK. And you know, just you know, to push it a little further, not only are these models super exciting, but there's a bunch of work on them. And so this is you know, roughly speaking, everything over, I forget the threshold, but a billion or more, I think, up to December 2022, and there's just lots of models. And this is parameter size. There's other ways you could visualize this, but there's lots of models, and there's lots of really big models. I think often you see people saying the models are getting bigger and bigger over time. I think that trend has sort of died. We're probably not going to see much, much bigger models. We can talk about that in the QA if people are interested. But there are going to be more, and there's going to be different types. But you know, there's only something like eight different colors here. So there's relatively few players that are actually training these models in the world. But there are a lot of them, and at least some of them are releasing them so we can study them more broadly. Okay, so that's just to situate us and help us understand where we are in the grand scheme of things. Um, but now, for the purpose of this talk, I want to kind of focus in a little bit on what you could call knowledge. So imagine you had a very structured query, like what year was Dante born in? You know, pre this big neural revolution, what you would do is you'd have a knowledge base of some sort. Maybe it's a big database, maybe it's something that you extracted from Wikipedia. Does you have some big graph, a structured piece of information, and then you could run a symbolic query, maybe in SQL. This is the simplest version of it with just a tuple. You could do much fancier queries, and you can see if you can figure out if that knowledge exists. But now, um, what we've done is we've shifted to a world where, clicking doesn't work, uh, where instead the language model can do every task. So instead of running a SQL query over a database, Instead, you just feed in a string and you ask it to predict that next word in the string. And then not only do you solve that task, but you actually say, is that knowledge learned by the neural network? Okay, so does the neural network have that knowledge? Where does it get it from? Well, it gets it from those trillion tokens it was trained on in the web. And really this talk, I want to focus on knowledge and understanding it and adapting it. So this is kind of to help us understand. And in general, uh, these are a bunch of different tasks that require different things, but they also require this knowledge. Um, this is from the palm paper, and these are different model sizes, which are getting from small to big to really big. And one thing that's happening as the models get bigger is they're just getting more and more of this knowledge. As they read the web, the bigger the model, the more it can soak up, the more it can remember of what it's read. And there's many things that get better as models get bigger, but this is one of them. And so it's interesting to study from our perspective. But of course, um, 
we're not happy with the state of the art of how you train these models. So, you know, you're seeing really big numbers, millions, tens of millions. Of course, you don't train them on one accelerator chip at a time, but if you did, it would take hundreds of years to do it. Um, it's just really, really expensive workloads. And so for this talk, what I really want to kind of hone, on, hone in on is like, do we really need to train these gigantic models where we compress all the world's information into these billions and billions of parameters? Or could we just be more clever? Could we design fundamentally different models that when they need to know something, they can just go look it up and read about it and then talk to you about what they just learned in real time? And that's what you could think of as a non-parametric or retrieval-based language model. Um, the hope is that we'll get smaller core models that have this sort of basic capabilities. And then when we need to know more, we'll have a retrieval component that in real time looks up and, and figures out the information. It needs. Okay. So just to say that again in a slightly more figurative thing, uh, what you could call the dense model that I was showing you at the beginning, the text comes in, it goes through a giant neural network, token comes out. And the retrieval model, text comes in, a retriever, some sort of model here, does a little extra work. It goes out and looks at its knowledge. For now, you could just think of this as being like all of Wikipedia. And it goes and finds a particular Wikipedia page or two or three that it thinks are most relevant. Those get concatenated, and then both the original context and those pages get fed in, and then it does the exact same thing. It's still using that universal interface of completing the string. It just gets more information when it has to do this job. Okay. And by the way, I didn't say, but I love questions along the way if things aren't clear or anything. I can totally manage the time. Or you can save them for the end and try to make them really hard. I also enjoy that. So why would we want to do this? Why would we want to go for a retrieval augmented language model? Well, I'll show you a bunch of instances. This is actually a pretty new area. We don't understand how to do this well yet. And it's actually addressable at an academic scale. And I'll try to convince you that as we go. Not every single question in the area, but a lot of them. But we hope we can get to the point where the models are very parameter efficient, much, much smaller models doing a much, much better job of predicting the next token, that they're more interpretable and less opaque. You can actually look at the information that they retrieved and see, did it actually use it? Was that actually helpful? And perhaps interestingly, also it's easier to update knowledge. So imagine you spent those millions of dollars, you trained this giant network, now you've got some new fact. Well, Colin and others have made some good progress on like how to inject that into that knowledge, but it's a really hard problem. Wouldn't you just rather update your textual data store, know that now you've updated information, you're good to go. It'll look it up when it needs to know it. Okay, so those are some of the longer term goals. That yeah, that's a really awesome question. So the question is, do we know that this is going to work out in the sense, and just make sure I understood, in the sense that like maybe there just isn't a small model that can give that core competency. Maybe there's more going on in the big model than just the knowledge, and there's other things you're going to lose. So you won't be able to get this whole kind of virtuous cycle that I was describing. It, initial evidence suggests we're going to be okay, but this is a great question to explore. And from my mind, this is research, right? We don't know all the answers before we start. And so I may be wrong, but, I, but it's a great hypothesis to have because if it's true, it's going to be really, really nice. But I don't think I can prove to you that that's true, but I think that the initial evidence from the models people have been building suggests that it probably is. And you'll see some of that through the talk as we go. It's a really great question. Other questions about the framing before I push forward? Okay, so this, this research area has probably been going on at least in the context of large language models, not for that long, maybe two, three years, it's been active. It's relatively new, but it's already in production, of course, like everything these days. And so if you've played with Bing's version of ChatGPT, it is retrieval based. When you type a query, it will go and run a few Bing searches, pull those pages back, put it in its context and use that information when it responds to you. Uh, it's super cool that's happening. It seems to hallucinate less. It can discuss current events. Uh, sadly, there's not a whole lot written about how it works. We could speculate that it's probably pretty closely related to some of the stuff you'll see in this talk later, but fundamentally, we just don't know. Okay, so that's kind of the state of affairs. A lot of these models are locked away. We can't study them. I'm a huge open science advocate. I'd love if that changed over time, but it's also a product and, you know, products are different than research, right? But it's kind of cool that these, these ideas are already having some impact being used. 
Okay, so that's the fending for the talk. I have two sections that are most of the time, and then the third section only if I have enough time to get to it. So first, what I want to do is talk to you about uh, not a small core competency with retrieval, but a different, more analysis-focused question. If, what if you want to retrieve the big, retrieval augment the biggest models in the world? Even though they were trained on all the data, if you retrieval augment them, could they get even better? Okay, and the answer is going to be yes. And the problem is we don't actually have access to those models, so we're going to do this in a black box way, where we can retrieval augment them without actually having access to their parameters just by calling like the GPT APIs. Okay, and that'll be the first part of the talk. And the second part of the talk, I'll focus, switch directions a little bit, and I'll go multimodal. So I'll show that everything has to, it was, all this was originally done for text-based models, but all of the ideas port over to the multimodal setting really nicely. And in this case, we won't be black box. We'll have a small model that's actually doing the language modeling part, and we'll get efficiency gains and other things. And I'll tell you why as we go. And you'll see maybe some of that core competency coming up. And then I'll just have a little survey of some open stuff with whatever time we have left. All right. So how does we usually set up a retrieval augmented language model? So the normal setup would be you've got these two pieces I was showing you earlier. You've got the frozen retriever, you've got a retriever, and you've got a language model that's going to incorporate the evidence that you retrieved. So typically what people will do in the early round of models is they'll take an off-the-shelf retriever. I'll tell you more about how that works later, but you know, basically you embed all the documents in some embedding space and do the nearest neighbor search, sort of a standard retrieval-based approach, not using a commercial search engine. Um, and they will just have a frozen version of that. That's a solved technology. And they're really just focused on how do you train something that can incorporate all that evidence? How did you do that fusion of everything you retrieve with the context you retrieve? And that was considered the biggest challenge and the hardest part of it all. It sort of makes sense. Like that fusion is probably a hard thing to do. What we did, and the way I led this project, uh, she was one of my PhD students at UW, and it was as part of her um, well, internship she did at Meta, is actually flip this whole story around. So remember, I told you that the big language models are zero shot. They can do everything out of the box, right? Like you can prompt them to do anything you want. So what if we just say, no, actually the hard part is being the retrieval, right? Or maybe there's no hard part at all. Let's just do that integration, that fusion zero shot with the model that already knows how to do everything anyways, just by prompting it differently. And then we can either have a frozen retriever and a frozen reader will have a completely zero shot that can be applied to any model, no matter whether you have access to it or not. That would be one thing you could do. Or the other thing you could do is actually use the frozen thing to, to provide you some signal, some loss that you can use to backprop and then actually train the retriever. So roughly speaking, you know, whichever documents would have actually led to predicting the next token better, we'll, we'll retrain the model to actually prefer to retrieve those. Okay. And so those are the two different approaches. And I, and I, I think, you know, you kind of know the whole story now. I'm going to walk you through so a little bit of technical details. You can take a little break if you're not interested, but that's basically what's going to happen. I'll walk you through it. I'll show you some results and then we'll come back to the multimodal case. Yeah, so I guess the question is if the data changes, would you necessarily have to retrain the retriever? Yeah, maybe. Uh, it hasn't been studied that much, but the goal in training a good retriever is that it should apply to any data. And it's typically done at a pretty big scale. So you might train on um, hundreds of millions of documents when you train your retriever. Of course, you can do it cheaper. There's all kinds of other things you can do differently. You can start from a pre-trained thing like you know, Roberto or Robert or something. But, but roughly speaking, this would be an interesting area to explore, but probably it's OK. I mean, all NLP models have domain shift issues. These are going to be no different than any other ones. Right? It is online, and we do have to pay OpenAI to do it. But you could change that. And you know, and the, with a different hat on a different talk I could give you someday, I could tell you about all the cool models that we're building and releasing that will hopefully be as good so we can eventually get rid of those API issues. But this is where we are for now. I would love to solve that, but that's kind of a different effort. Other questions? What is the smallest language model you try to do this this retrieval augmented language model? Like what Okay, great question. So the retrievers in general are pretty small. So think uh, for size. I was asking the language models. This part over here? Yeah, what's the smallest language model you try that can 
perform good in this kind of framework? Yeah, so if you're going to fine tune it, then like the T5 models are, are a good choice and they work really well. If you're going to keep it frozen, I think you need to go like 10 billion or more. And I can't remember. There's probably some graphs later. We can look at it again. Uh, but but it, but but the bigger the better if you're doing zero shot in practice. Maybe that will change in the future too. Okay, let me get, let me get into some details and then ask me think of some more questions when we get to the experiments and I'll be happy to talk more. So to, to talk you through this, I'm going to need to tell you three things. I'm going to tell you how I do the document retrieval, how I do the fusion, how I like incorporate the context with the new documents and how I train the whole thing when I'm doing that extra fine tuning step. The first two, I'll do kind of one slide each. I'll just give you a glimpse and have you look at the paper for the details. And the last one, I'll give you like three slides, just give you a little bit of an overview, all very high level, but hopefully you get enough information to get you excited to learn more, okay? So the retrieval approach, I've already said this out, but just to visualize it, uh, this is a pop out. My colors aren't working, but you know, there should be a little pop out window. This goes here. Um, Basically, there exist lots of methods that can take an arbitrary text, run it through something like BERT, and produce a single vector for it. These are document embedding methods. And the way you train retrievers in practice is you get documents that you think should be close to each other, documents that you think should be far from each other, and you just train those things to push them closer or further apart. So it's basically a supervised learning problem. And the hard part is like exactly which pairs do you use? Because if you, even if you have some gold data of pairs that are good, like finding hard negatives, it can be a lot of work in practice. But this is not hard, and, and there's a bunch of papers on it, and we're basically just going to adopt that standard dense retrieval approach. Okay. At least until we get to the end of the training. Uh, for, the, for the information fusion, we have a little bit of a wrinkle. So we'd like to do this zero shot, but these black box language models over here, if you know about how they work, they have a limit on how many tokens you can put into them. It's called a context length. Uh, in practice, it'll be like 2,000 or 8,000 words, right? When I say tokens, just think words. 2,000 or 8,000 words you can feed in. And in general, though, we'd like to be able to, to get lots of evidence back from our search. We'd like to have effectively an unlimited number of documents we can feed in. So this causes a little bit of wrinkle. If you're only going to feed in one document at a time, the simplest thing to do is just put that document, put the context, have the model predict the next token, see what happens. If you were to, you could, you could then generalize that set of just concatenate more and more documents to the input, but you'd run out of space pretty quickly. Does that make sense? So instead, what we do is a really simple ensembling scheme. So for every document that we retrieve, we separately pass it through the model. This is expensive, but it's not n squared, like in the context, it's just order n. Um, everyone you, you feed through, you get their predictions for the next word. And you do just some simple sort of multiplicative averaging of those and you ensemble them together. And this allows you to kind of scale the number of documents a little bit slowly, lots of calls to the API, but you can do it and you can get nice results. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the first kind of trick in getting things to work. All right, so now, okay, you know how we're gonna do the retrieval, you know how we're gonna do the fusion, let me talk you through how we do that training where we're getting that kind of end-to-end -end signal. Yeah. Do you actually want me to unmute? Who, who popped this up? Okay, I'm going to stay muted. I don't think I should unmute. Something popped up in the Zoom. Okay, so the training is going to have three steps. Um, I'm going to do some retrieval. That's step one. Step two, um, for each of those things I retrieve, I'm going to see how much the model likes predicting the next word that's actually there. This is supervised. Then know what next word's coming next. And then if those two distributions kind of don't match each other, if, if the ones that actually like the next word aren't the ones that the retriever preferred to retrieve, I'm going to do some sort of machine learning update to push them closer to each other. So that next time, if I would do the retrieval, a different thing would be ranked higher by the retriever. So those are the three steps. Does it make sense? And I have pictures for them, but you kind of know the whole machine learning to a character view just from this one slide. So the, the, it turns out I didn't really tell you much about how the retriever works, but you can normalize those cosine distances that I was showing you earlier. And just when you do retrieval with any of these models, you naturally get a distribution over documents that tells you how much, you know, given the query, in this case, that's that string that you're trying to complete, how much it thinks that each of those are the right documents should be retrieving to that context. Okay, so that's our first distribution. Our second distribution, is going to be uh, very similar. So we did the retrieval. We take those same documents we got, 
And we now know what the actual next word is here at Apple. And so we're going to compute condition on those documents. If I were to feed it into that black box I was showing you before for the fusion, I'll do it separately for each one. And I'll say, well, okay, what's the probability that each of those things that that Apple would be the next word? And then that's not a natural distribution, but you can just kind of do a little soft max trip and renormalize those numbers. You can get a distribution out of that. We would like these two distributions to be synced up with each other. We'd like the ones that are actually preferring the next word in a soft way to be the ones that the retriever actually returns. Okay. And then finally, the last step three is you just uh, use parallel divergence, cross entropy, you know, whatever, uh, and you you'd make a loss function out of that. And you feed that into PyTorch and have it be back up for you. Um, but crucially, you do not change the parameters of the black box because we don't have access to that. Uh, you only change the parameters of the retrieval. Does that make sense? OK, so that's all I have to say about this method. If you have any questions about it, this would be the time before we get into experiments. Does this require any sort of back through the black box model? No, because it's only in the weights for the loss. Yeah, good question. The question is, do you have the back, back prop through the black box? And the answer is no, because it's just the weights. OK, so I'm going to go ahead. Uh, how many documents do you desire? Mm. I yeah. cut the hyperparameter slide, which was poor choice on my part. I do not remember. I'm thinking it's not large. It's something like 10. We would have to go look at the paper. So for each query, like, you reduce a number of tokens. And you feed those tokens to the list query into the black box. So that means that if the effective computer things be increased by the amount of token you, you receive. I wonder if you use the same amount of computer, the scale up model, which one is more worth? Yeah, that's a great question. So you know, instead of retrieval augmenting and spending all the compute, we do that. What if we just took a bigger base dense model? If I understood the question. That's a great, that's hard to do that controlled study. In particular, I'm going to do these on top of GPT, whatever, with 175B parameters. So I can't even afford to train that bigger model to do that controlled study. But it's a great question. I'm pretty sure retrieval would win, but I, I don't even know how to do that calculation. So I, I haven't done it. But it's really fun to think through. We could talk about it maybe afterwards. And I can't promise you, but I'm pretty sure we would win. And it's a good question to ask. Um, OK, so I'm going to, the blue results are going to be that zero shot setup where you don't do that extra machine learning with the loss. You literally just put the things together and see how they do. And the red results are going to be where we do, where we do the, the propagation and actually update the retriever to be better based on the black box. So first, I'll just do language modeling. Uh, the x-axis here is the size of the model that we're augmenting. So notice as models get so lower is better. And all this is showing you without any retrievals at the baseline of course gets to the scale. This is this is like a measure of entropy, so lower is better bits per byte, if you know it. Uh, about 0 0.05 bits per byte is considered a big gain often. Uh, here's what happens when we go zero shot. We get this nice consistent gain across all the different scales. Things are consistently better. This is you know without any fine-tuning. And then we get a bit more of a gain when we go and retune the true retriever to give us a better uh, better result of being into our black box. Is, is the test set here disjoint from the uh, X database you're retrieving from? Yeah, everything's disjoint. Hopefully from the training too, although you never know with the APIs. Um, everything's disjoint. Um, we also did some zero shot end tasks. So if you're not an NLP person, this is basically just a set of tasks like I was showing earlier in the talk where you kind of have to predict the next token and that's as if you're doing lots of different NLP problems. And this is a particular set of them that's been pulled together as a benchmark that gets commonly used. So here I'm showing you uh, one of the GPT models called Codex, uh, Palm, which is a much bigger but it's a very similar model trained at Google, and, and Plan, which is a version of that that's been specially fine-tuned to do even better at these kinds of tasks. So like an extra level of work on top of it. Um, and I should say the pom pom came out. Uh, so we ended up right here. We were really sad because if pom pom didn't exist, we would have looked like we got this amazing gain. Our, our, our smaller, our small 175B model was beating a 540B model just with retrieval augmentation, which I'm still really excited about. Of course, there's other ways to get even bigger gains, so that tempers the results a little bit. 
Uh, but, but relatively speaking, this is like closing the gap with much, much bigger things. This small model is fighting way above this league, even though it in itself is actually a gigantic, huge model. Does that make sense, the story? So, I hope they should maybe include this slide because for, because for this kind of model. So, I think one important baseline is that you could just extend the contact window. So, to include more, maybe, to include more text uh, just ahead of the maybe beginning in the original model. So, I'm wondering how maybe this model with that yeah, I didn't quite catch the details of the baseline. We can talk about it some more. Um, but I think roughly to summarize, I mean, probably you could ask lots of different questions. Like, what if you change the dense model this way? What if you change the dense model that way? And my rough answer is probably you get gains by doing that. And probably you'd still get gains on top of it by retrieval augmenting. Because everything about the base model here is very black box, right? And, and I think the overall takeaway story is even gigantic 175 billion models haven't memorized all the information that we were trained on, right? Because roughly, although the data is destroying, I mean, it was trained on everything roughly. And then we don't know exactly what it was trained on. So we got our own purpose. So probably it was trained on a lot that was in our retrieval and it's still got better. So as a general trend, we kind of expect things to get better with retrieval no matter what scale you're operating at. I can't do the Palm experiments. I'm not at Google, but if I had access there, I'd be kind of shocked. Uh, it was looking good, like it would generalize. Okay. So sorry, I, I punted on your question. We can follow up more later. Um, then this is the x-axis here is the number of documents. That top blue curve is just randomly selecting the documents rather than doing using the retrieval model. That's kind of a baseline ablation. Uh, and in general, things are getting better with more documents and randomly selecting documents is not working. And uh, I'll just go through it very quickly, but we did this for other models too, on other data sets, uh, Bloom, OPT, other models. It, it's a general phenomenon. You get gaps all over the place, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but it's a very simple idea that works very generally. Okay, so that's our summary of the first part. And we have this notion now that like, we have this general retrieval augmentation. You find your documents, you put them in the context, you condition on them, uh, and it's gonna work out of the box on lots of different stuff. Uh, now I want to take a very different twist and kind of show you a whole different side of this, which is to think about doing this in a multimodal setting. It's going to be exactly the same, except there aren't any of these APIs in the multimodal setting. So we're going to train, you know, we're not going to assume the black box. We're going to train that part ourselves. So it'll give you an alternate view back towards how things were done before the black box. But it makes sense in the multimodal. You don't really have any other choice but to do that. And then we'll also talk a lot more about efficiency and can you get some benefits from doing this. As you go. Okay, so for the multimodal models, um, you know, there's been a huge revolution. Text to image is a thing. If you haven't heard of it, you should go on Twitter. It's everywhere. Um, Dali, Dali two, Party from Google, and you know, most of these models aren't that big. Because Party in particular did scale. It was a transformer-based model, and it did scale up the size of the model. And it's a really beautiful figure from that paper showing that, like, as the model gets bigger and bigger, the quality of the images get better. So when I tell you that like everything from the first part of the talk will apply here, you might think like, what the heck, how does that work? These are images, these are not text. How are we gonna pull this off? Well, there's a key trick that Dolly Wan and Parti and others did, which is this notion of an image tokenizer, okay? And I'm not really gonna teach this to you, I'm just gonna like wave my hands and show you pictures. But roughly speaking, you can train an auto that goes from an image so a sequence of tokens in a code book that you train for yourself, it's really unclear what these tokens are, but they're discrete. Uh, and they're, you train a code book for them too. And then the model goes back to the image again. So there's a pre-processing step that anytime I see an image, I can essentially just replace it with a thousand words from this new image vocabulary that gets trained. And then I can undo that and go back to the image. And so there's a ton of research and the, the, the projector isn't so great here, but you know this is the original image. This is some old way of doing this. And then you know you can choose the size and the complexity of your autoencoder. And you can get to the point where the final images look really shockingly close to the original images. You're getting not a lot of loss. The worry about something like this is that you would have irrecoverable loss. You couldn't get back the original image, but in fact, you can. So there's a lot of techniques that exist that you can just discretize images into sequence of tokens. Actually, this is true for speech. This is true for every modality. 
Okay, so if you haven't heard of this, you can just take my word on it. You can go read about these papers. It's really beautiful work. And then the really nice thing from my perspective, like I'm an NLP person fundamentally, I'm not as good as multimodal as Mohit and others are. Um, but, you know, now when I look at an image, I just think that's a sequence of tokens. Okay, and now I can just use all the tools I know completely in a multimodal setting and it all works. And that's what I'll show you now for retrieval. Does that make sense? The second question you might be thinking is, well, why in the world would you need to do retrieval for images? They don't have this knowledge problem. They don't have this long tail like text does. And, and if you're thinking that, I just tell you that you're sort of right, but you're actually wrong. Because in fact, you know, if I'm asking for a particular kind of dog, you know, you need to have knowledge of what that dog looks like, right? Or if I'm showing you a place, you need a lot of world knowledge to know uh, that that's a very specific architectural building in a very specific location. And so basically, a lot of that world knowledge you would think would only show up in databases and text and so forth, it also shows up in the multimodal image set. You know? So retrieval augmentation is also super useful. Does that make sense? So is it important that this be a sequence of tokens or this is just that like is, does it really encode the position of the tokens? Yeah, the position of the tokens in the sequence does not correlate with position in the image. But it's convenient to have a sequence because then you can just apply a transformer to it. If it was a set, you could probably do fancy transformer position hackery and be fine. But it's just, you know, it's not important that it's a sequence, but it's convenient. Yeah, that's a great question. Other questions? So the slides in the first half were made by Weisha. The slides in the second half were made by Michi. Uh, Michi from Stanford was an intern that did this project. Um, but you notice it's basically the same cycle. So the only thing that really changes now, I've got a retriever. I've got a multimodal document memory. But a multimodal document memory for this talk, you could apply this actually to web pages with images. We can have arbitrary sequences of text and images. It's all fine. But for this talk, we're just using data that's got captions and image pairs. So each multi document is a sentence and image. Okay, and so you just got a whole bunch of those. There's tons of corpora. We'll use Lion, but you could use all sorts of different stuff. Uh, and you'll retrieve from those pairs. You'll condition on them. You'll generate them. You know, everything is fine. It's all just sequences of tokens. Those are just documents that can be other documents. That's our worldview. Okay. All right. So. Um, I'll deep dive a little bit into each of these parts, but I'll go a little bit quickly because we've seen it. There's a lot of redundancy. So the retriever here is this, this picture is very similar, right? Uh, the only difference, the query here can be an image or a text. The thing you're going to retrieve could be an image or a text or a mix of the two. Um, and then we're going to base it on a different kind of embedding model. So, so actually clip is what you want here. So clip can match images to vectors, can map images to vectors, you can map text to vectors, and you can even average those two vectors and do other things with them. So, so it's basically the same setup, but we're like using clip instead of Roberta and other things as the model that's going to get to uh, if you need it to read. Right. Now, similarly, we need to talk about how to do that fusion, fusion stuff, how you put everything together. Um, here, what we're going to do is a little trick. Um, that normally when you do these models, they can only generate left to right. But we train a version of these models that can do something called uh, causal masking. So you can mask out parts of the sequence and move it to the end. You know, T5 and others did this before us. But we were doing it here in a left to right model. Um, and then you can learn not just to generate let things left to right, but you can leave a hole and learn to infill that hole. OK, not super clear why you're going to need to do that yet. I'll show you in just a second. But it's going to allow us to have flexible models that can go image to text or text to image along the same model. We don't need to pick for one of the cases. We'll be able to infill or, or go left to right as needed. Okay. So, so okay, so here's that, that demonstration. So here's an original doc. We'll just arbitrarily choose that text always come before images. So we sequence the tokens in our doc, multimodal documents. So then if you're doing image to text, I'm sorry, if you're doing text to image, it's very simple. It's the normal kind of left to right generation scheme. But if you're doing image to text, then you have to actually put in a mask, put the image, and then have the model infill what would have come with the image. Okay. But the cool thing is you just train it with the data both ways, and then you're good to go. Okay. Is, is there an advantage of doing this versus just randomly swapping the order of the image and text? You know what I mean? No, I mean, I think you might need it. It's probably going to figure it out. Just 
the reason we were doing this is because we were going to actually try to generalize the full documents with lots of different masks, like an HTML page or something, but we never actually got there. So probably it's not necessary. But at least it helps you see the whole picture of how it all fits together. All right, and then how do we do the information fusion on top of this? Well, in this case, we're not going to do that ensemble we saw before. We'll just do the concatenation version. Okay. So we'll, you know, if you want to you want to do some tasks, you'll have the main document over there. You'll concatenate, you'll concatenate, uh, you'll you'll complete the document. That makes sense. So in this case, because we retrained our model, we're gonna actually retrain that model not to a black box. You know, we can play around with things a little bit more. And in particular, we just ramped up the context length to 5,000. And then our images have a thousand tokens in each image. So that gave us a max of two multimodal documents in the context for each document you wanted to generate. Not perfect, but it's good enough for now. You can always come back and do ensembling or other tricks for that thing. Okay. Now, the other trick is how do we actually go about training this model to do the fusion? This is what the data will look like. Um, in practice, actually, what you can do when you're training a transformer where you just train on sequences, you can just basically sort your data to make it look like this and actually train with data where you have the right documents in the context. So for each training example in your data, you can run your retrieval, get two related documents, stick them right there in the context, and you're going to actually train the model to fuse as opposed to just doing a black box. So all of your training data will be arranged like you see on this slide here. Does that make sense? And otherwise, it's really even though you literally use the exact same code you would use to train a text on the model, exact same hyperparameters. We stole directly from the LAMA models. We're using the same uh, code base that was, that was in there. Actually, an earlier version of it, but essentially. Is. One little caveat, uh, actually, you know, you could imagine that when you're training, you would only want to take loss on that final document and not on the documents, the tokens for the documents you retrieved. If you know how these losses work, that would be more natural because that's the only thing you're predicting. But that's super wasteful because you have to do the same amount of compute no matter what. So to make training a little bit more efficient, we actually take loss on all the tokens, but then scale down the loss to this over here with a hyperparameter so that you're still mostly focusing on that, but you can learn a little bit from the from completing those tokens too. And that seems to make it more efficient. Okay. All right, so that, that's basically it. Uh, not too much more to say. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions or start talking about how this model works. Very, very simple approach, at least for me. Does it actually work worse if you make alpha equals one? I've got that on a slide later. Okay. It, 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 uh, I think it works the same, but it's less efficient. Or maybe it works, if you compute control it, it will work worse. But for, for data control, it's pretty easy. Other questions? Uh, do you think you can achieve like a uh, competition in this way? Or right now, it mostly supports like a uh, fusion just between two documents at once? So what what, did you, what was the first thing to do? Other than fusion, what's the other option? Uh, like composition, like you have multiple. Oh, composition. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll, I'll show you some cool pictures. It will absolutely compose things from the two documents together. Um, absolutely. It can do anything it wants with those tokens. They're all fair made for it, right? OK. So this is roughly the scale of things we're working at. It's not a cheap model. Um, it's not academic scale. But if people release pre-trained models, you could tune it to do this much more efficiently. Okay. Um, and it's not a gigantic scale either. Uh, and if, before I forget, I'll say that we are actively working on scaling this up. We have experiments running on a lot of GPUs right now. I won't talk about it in the talk, but if you're interested, you can follow up with me. I'd be happy to share them on. Um, looking at some scaling laws. So these are the size of the models. Here, this uh, yellow model is the, that base causal mass model, which we did train more. So that's another reason we kept it is for comparability to the baseline. Um, and then this is the retrieval augmented version of the exact same thing. Uh, all different parameter scales. Complexity here, lower is better. This is another one of those entropy measures. Um, and we're getting nice consistent gains across all the different scales. Uh, in terms of, of, terms of uh, efficiency, uh, again, I can show you afterwards some unpublished results for this for bigger models. But here, this is a FID is a measure of image generation quality where lower is better. Uh, and this is the amount of compute it took to train these models. 
These are previous models that are public that are transformer based models that don't do any retrieval augmentation. So here you're getting this really nice scaling curve. The more compute you pour in, the better that party is that if you remember at the beginning, those were the big model that actually was really good on the right. That's that party one down there. And here's our model. We haven't quite closed the gap with the performance, but we kind of half the gap at just like way, way, way less compute. Right. So you're getting efficiency by training with that retrieval augmentation. The only difference between this model and this model is whether you train with retrieval augmentation. What's the FID of just returning the first context document? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. FID is a. Uh, I guess, right, that's it. It doesn't include captions for any. Sorry, dumb question. No, 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 it's not a dumb question at all. It's a good baseline. I don't know the answer. I don't think it'd be that great. I think it'd be, I think it'd be worse than all these because the closest image is not close enough. It looks very different. And I'll show you some examples. Because often the images that it would turn will give you like background knowledge. So it won't actually look like the output, but it'll give you the information you need to actually figure out the output. But that's a good question. Okay, uh, just for, for time, we did ablations. So um, again, you know, just randomly ret retrieving things as opposed to using the, the clip retriever is not good. Um, just putting a single document is not as good. And actually, there's a little tweak. I'll let you look at the paper for details, but um, uh, you want diversity in your two documents. And if, if your data store has very similar multimodal documents in it, it's kind of wasteful to just put the same thing in there twice. And so you can do a little bit of extra tweaking and diversity there. You'll get better numbers. Um, and here's our alpha numbers. Uh, this is perplexity. So such big perplexities because they're for images. It's kind of hard to know how to think about them. But we are getting the best with that alpha and zero and one are both true. So were there some uh, sort of, I guess you showed some interesting examples of what could be people. Great question. <laughs> I was taking too long with the numbers. I was wondering if I could get that many numbers. Okay, so here I'll show you a bunch of examples. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the outputs of the, of the retrieval augmented model, the prompt, the text, this is text to image, the outputs of the, the, the CM3 model are baseline that we did the retrieval on top of, but without the retrieval, and the results of stable diffusion, which is a very strong text to image model. Okay. And so on the first row, the prompt is the mean dynasty vase with orange flowers painted instead. Uh, I guess not instead, with orange flowers painted. So it turns out, I don't know if you know about mean dynasty glasses, but they have this very distinctive blue style. They really shouldn't have orange flowers. So if you were to do that, you would just paint like a few in, but you really need to match that Ming dynasty style, which is kind of interesting. And it's able to do that, whereas the other models don't really know what the Ming dynasty style is at all. This is that knowledge that they don't have. Uh, this one is kind of scary from a misinformation point of view, but anyways, um, the French flag waving on the surface of the moon. So on the right, what is it done? It's the American flag. And why is that? Because every image on the web is the American flag on the moon. There are no others. And so just that's what it always produces, no matter what you tell it. But if you retrieve the French flag and showed a picture of it, it will happily copy that over the different result. Okay, so lots of copying, a little bit scary, but uh, super cool. More examples, Armenian churches uh, have a very distinctive steeple that these generic models don't know what it is. But if you show an example of that, you can put it in context and get the other things right about the, the weather and so forth. Um, and then Mount Rainier, one of my favorites in Seattle. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a much better job. And then I think the final example I have for you is uh, as a composition. So here I want the photo of the Statue of Liberty next to the Washington Monument. The baselines kind of sort of do something weird, two Statues of Liberty or something, but it goes and finds a picture of each to make sure it knows what they look like and is able to piece them together really well. It would be a nice output. Okay. Um, I'm gonna leave some time for questions at the end. So I will just give you kind of one more cool vignette. These models can take, as I said, text and images and arbitrary sequences. I just think of them, you know, an image is just a sequence of text. So you can also do this so-called in-context learning thing that you typically only do for text. So I give it an image and then the word animal X image, the word animal Y, another image, the word animal, and I ask you to predict the next token. And it will predict X or Y appropriately and get like decent classification scores. You treat that as a binary classification problem. 
despite the fact that I never kind of taught it what X and Y should mean, is kind of learning that from those examples. And you can do zero shot, and one shot, and two shot versions of it. So, so we're kind of scratching the needle of what we can do here. We have some other results that are not published yet where we start with instruction fine tuning these models. You can think about doing RLHF with them. Basically, anything you can do with a large text based model when you adopt this kind of unified view comes for free in the multimodal set. So uh, I know you're uh, tight on time, but a quick follow up question so was, uh, it might be interesting to, so these are already, uh, uh, I was wondering if it might be useful to have an out of distribution kind of benchmark here, because FID by definition is like trying to see if the output images distribution matches the training image distribution. And then also for retrieval, right, it would be pretty cool if, if it basically doesn't find the French flag in the training data itself. Right versus actually benefits from the retrieved memory specifically. Yeah. So separating the memory versus sort of in distribution. Uh, yeah. I, know, yeah, I think for captioning, obviously, and DQ, there are OOT benchmarks, but yeah. for image generation, also now there's stuff popping up. Yeah. Yeah. Really so. yeah, that'd be awesome. I think that'd be really great. And I skipped over the captioning example, but it can, of course, do image to text also. And this one is pretty highly compositional. So busy street, blah, 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 lots of stuff going on, and it, it can be really done. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, and in general, even for text, it's kind of hard to know like how much is it using the facts that are in that text and how much is it just getting it in the right domain, for example. Is it giving it some related text, but it's not actually using the knowledge? That's kind of an open challenge for the field. Actually. Okay, so that's that's the summary. The second part is full parallel, but we're actually getting more efficient training by doing retrieval augmentation. That's super fun. We should try to develop that some more. Um, and I'll start with, start with just a one slide vignette here and say that this whole area is very new. You know, there are, there's definitely growing amounts of work, but the earliest papers were a few years ago. Um, and we don't even know, for example, what the basic units of retrieval should be. So in this talk, I only talked about kind of retrieving whole documents or paragraphs, bigger chunks of text and concatenating them. But there's really excellent work where the retrieval is token level where the retrieval is over phrases and you try to get names of things. And there's kind of many, many other possibilities you can imagine. Of course, I showed you two different versions of what is trained, the retriever versus the fusion model. You could do it all jointly. You could do nothing at all. And then I only scratched the surface of thinking about like what would the data store be? What should be in there? The retro model from DeepMind showed really cool scaling laws. Like as the data store gets bigger and bigger and bigger for a text-based model, things just got better and better and better. So I would say this is a very exciting area with lots of open questions. Some of them are at a scale that would be hard to do in academic, but many, I'd say, you know, most of them are not. So I would encourage you to you know, read some papers, have fun, uh, think about what you could do in that area. Uh, and I'll stop there. I'll show you the two main papers that were for this. Uh, and I will take questions with my last slide. Um, I think the two augmented models are doing a great job in trying to do efficient size and very little of them and all. But does that also bring like more time consuming on the inference side since you are doing like retrieval on a lot of um, documents or something like that? Is there any analysis on this kind of I don't know, like trade off or something like that? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So the question is basically it's really cool to be efficient training, that's important, but also at inference time we've added an extra step. And how much does that cost and is that painful? I mean, the short answer is it is cost costly. And then you also have to make your context longer, which could be costly. Um, but it's actually like um, there are these really great libraries for fast, dense retrieval, things called like FICE and these other libraries. And so you can like embed billions of points in a dense embedding space and retrieve kind of in millisecond timeframes. Okay, so, so it's actually very usable. If you want to get up to trillions of things that you're embedding, then it's harder. So like doing the scaling up is hard, but for an academic scale, this is really, really large and you can afford to do it. And it will fit on a single GPU. They do all kinds of quantization, fancy KD trees. I mean, actually nearest neighbor search is like really active in the theory literature too. Like there's some really interesting GC problems there. And you could, you know, I think people could do a whole PhD getting into that and thinking about how to do it better for NLP. But even just the out of the box techniques that exist are very, very efficient. And useful. Just a quick follow-up question. So, and another thing is that, Compared to the like training a better model, does that means that getting a better document or, or a large number of database is also really works well in this kind of like programs or so this kind of message. That's right, absolutely. I think that figuring out what's the right data to put in the data store 
is, is very interesting and worthy of study. And I would even take that a step further. So I think data quality and quantity is important for everything, including the dense model training or the, or the base model training. You know, figuring out what data to use and why to use it is really, really interesting research challenge. And so far we've been kind of spoiled. We've just been able to throw more and more data at the thing, but that's almost certainly not the right thing to be doing. And I wish in general there was more work on data quality uh, as part of our general NLP community. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I have two questions for the first part, actually. So um, it looks like the, um, you don't have to go back to the- That's okay, go ahead, just while you're talking on this thing. Yeah, okay. Um, it looks like like um, the assumption is um, each question can be answered by a single document uh, in this setting, and I'm not sure whether I understand correctly. So I wonder like uh, if in some cases, like we need one documents to answer this question, and how can we incorporate the language model score by the single document paired with the question in that way. So that's the first question. Uh, second question is, um, so suppose we're not doing this kind of like, a, this is basically trying to retrieve uh, not query from the model, but suppose we're doing more complicated tasks and um, which requires language model to, to use their complicated reasoning skills or whatever skills. And your KL divergence based training is basically trying to pass some information to the retriever and try to teach it somehow. Um, and I wonder, like, uh, if this, if, um, like, if, if the scale itself is kind of complicated, what kind of information is really passed to the retriever, and what what part is kind of more challenging to pass it? Because basically, like, a retriever is basically just encoding uh, the document passages, uh, passages, trying to measure the similarities, whether the, you know, the language model can do more, like, uh, understand um, the information better. So I wonder whether all the information, all the skills, can be successfully passed to the retriever by this, uh, KL, uh, yeah, those are awesome questions. I'm going to start on the first one, and then you, you might have to remind me a little bit the second one, but I think I got them both. So the first question is a really great one. It's basically, you know, notice, I mean, I am doing this ensemble trick, but still each document is being passed in one at a time. So can it actually fuse information across documents? I would say this model is probably worse at that than the model in the second half, where you were passing in two documents at once. But even then, that was only two. Uh, in general, one nice thing about building everything on transformers is that the field is making rapid progress and like expanding transformers to have longer contexts. That's going to get, you know, that's already kind of solved. We were just not taking the, the sort of greatest and latest. So it'd be pretty easy to make this longer. It's, it's not that hard. We just, you know, we started this project before all that was integrated. Uh, and probably the ensemble can do a little bit of fusion, but it's in a very indirect way, only down there, uh, not in the deeper way you might hope there would be. Uh, the second question, uh, let's see what was the second question. So basically, what kind of skills can be really oh, right. So when we backpop through this guy, um, what can we actually learn? And that's a really great question. Um, and in particular, we didn't tease it apart as well as we could, because what we might just be learning is the quirky idiosyncrasies of the black box. We might not be learning anything that looked like the linguistic skill at all. It might just be that this version of Codex or whatever model we were using there happens to have some quirks and doesn't handle some stuff well. And so because we're using that for the loss, we'll try to not retrieve those documents that it can't handle. I don't know the answer. How much of it is like weird learning to compensate for the quirkiness of the black box and how much of it is actually adding new information. That'd be really fascinating to study, but we just didn't get to it. So it looks, if, if that's the case, then it's basically trying to adapt the preference of a hard neck use so of this uh, retrieval. I think that's a fair thing. Yeah, okay. adapting to the preference of the, of the black box for the retriever. Cool. I think we're a little bit past time, um, so maybe we'll stop then. Uh, but uh, let's thank Luke again, and uh, please eat some cupcakes. Thank you.